morning. <laughs> My name is Renee Flack, and I'll be reading the lesson this morning. Um, our first lesson today comes from the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. <clears throat> if you picked up a Bible um, as you enter today, um, consider this a gift from St. Luke. You can keep it if you don't have one. You will find the, uh, the first lesson on page 1,118. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God gave a... For the Spirit of God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Our second lesson comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. And you will find this lesson on page 934 of the Church Bible. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am always with you to the very end of the age. This is the word of our Lord. everyone this morning. Oh, what am I doing? All right. Sorry about that. So good morning. It's nice. To, oops. <laughs> now I'm all flustered. <clears throat> it's all right. You all know me and love me. So I'm Laura Whistler. Um, our family has been members here for about 10 years. Um, we have two daughters, 17 and 14. So the world is spinning fast for us. Um, Chris plays the guitar in the band. I've lived in the Columbus area pretty much my whole life, and I'm crazy about Jesus. But you might not know that. So, and we're going to talk about that. I'm really glad you're here, despite the title of the message. When, C when Steve asked me to speak today, I was delighted. About a year ago, I felt a call in my life to teach about Jesus, and so I've been studying and writing and preparing for when he would use me. And I thought, he said I could talk about anything I wanted to. So I made a list of all the things that I might want to talk about. Maybe I'd get to talk about prayer or the power of the Holy Spirit to change your life. And... Maybe I could talk about some of the things that I've been wrestling with with God or some of the struggles that he's helped me with. So I made my list, and I offered it to him, and I waited. After a few short days, everything on my list was discarded, and I was told to talk about evangelism. <clears throat> yeah, that was not on my list. So I argued. I don't know if you've ever argued with God. It was a short argument. Didn't even get my points across before he knocked them all down. And he's, it was, in short, it was that I didn't want to talk about it and I didn't think you wanted to hear about it. As a principal, I'm fine with evangelism. I don't mind that it exists. I'm friendly with people in the hallway at church. I've been working on my Bible study. <clears throat> if you meet me in Kroger, I'm super friendly. If you want to know that I'm a Christian, I'll tell you about it. So evangelism is fine with me. But I figured, that's fine. He wants to talk about it, so I'll prepare, and we'll talk about it. So I went to my resources, my bookcases. I don't know about you, but I have a special book, bookshelf. They're my favorite books on the shelf. They're lined up there. They're well-dusted because they've been moved around a lot. And so I went to my bookshelf. Nothing on evangelism. So I looked in the three bookcases that were there in the den, not a single book. I went to the annex in the basement, mostly Chris's stuff, 
No books on evangelism there. <laughs> nothing in the family room. We're kind of book junkies. And nothing. No books about evangelism. Finally, in a last-ditch effort, I went to the stack of the I should be reading books, the ones that are next to the bed. There they were, two, two books, right at the bottom. Neither of them read. Okay, good start. <laughs> Lots of resources on this, stuff, this subject. But what were all my other books about? I had lots of books to get to know Jesus, to understand Jesus, to how, to, how to live my life for Jesus, how to have better relationships because of Jesus. And nothing, almost nothing, about evangelism. I was worried about what was in it for me. What was gonna, how was it gonna help me? I wasn't so much worried about how I was gonna help him. And so that's what the point is here. What are we here for? My purpose is to worship and glorify the Lord. And learning about evangelism is one great way to worship and glorify the Lord. Before I go any further, let me pause here and explain why I'm going to use the word evangelism, even when it's a trigger word for some of us, me included. Inside the church, evangelism is a word that creates anxiety and insecurity. And outside the church, evangelism smacks of judgment and condemnation. I'm sure we can all recall some negative stereotype or caricature of evangelism, the guy on the street corner with the microphone and the sign. But here's the deal. You're all smart people. You don't need me to come up with some conglomeration of words to make you feel comfortable with the idea of evangelism. Because all evangelism is, is sharing the gospel. Sharing what the Lord has done in your life with someone in a way that points them to God. The 19th century preacher C.H. Spurgeon said, evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. So here goes. I've organized this morning's lesson to answer those famous questions. Who, why, when, where, and what? So let's start with who does evangelism? We'll get this one out of the way. We do. If you're a believer in Jesus, it's your job to tell people about him. I'm sorry if that's not what you want to do or what you wanted to hear. Maybe it would be nice if just Steve would do it or maybe just Greg. But that's not, it's all of us. In Matthew 9.37, Jesus said, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest. Notice what Jesus said we should ask for, what we should pray for. He said, ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into his harvest. He didn't say pray that there would be a harvest. Jesus had seen the harvest. He knew the hearts of people. He knew the multitude of people yearning to hear the truth of God's love. Jesus didn't say pray the harvest would work out, that the gospel would have weight and meaning. He didn't say ask God to save people. Jesus knew the work of preparing for the harvest had already been done. The gospel would work. People would be saved. The workers are the problem. Once upon a time, each of us was the harvest. Someone took time to share Jesus with you and nurture you along until you gave yourself to Christ. Now, you're the worker. You are the evangelizer. So we have the who. It's us. Now, why? Why do we evangelize? Why should we evangelize? Simply because Jesus told us to. As if he hadn't modeled it throughout his entire life. Constantly t telling and showing people the love of God countless piles of miracles and his final words to us were go and make disciples 
In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, go and make disciples of the nations. I'm an English major, so I looked at the words. There's no qualifier there. There's no do this, then do this. There's no do this first. There's just do it. He didn't say once you understand scripture, once you've memorized enough verses, in a moment of desperation, tell someone about Jesus. He didn't say pay someone else to do it. He didn't say thou shalt joineth a church and hireth a pastor to telleth the world about me. He simply said go and tell. Go tell people. He didn't say live a godly life and they'll catch on. He said, tell people. Evangelism is actually, it's a lifestyle. You either talk about Jesus or you don't. You're either the person at the grocery store who praises the Lord for the harvest of tomatoes in the produce section or you're silent, which is like me. A few months ago, a friend at church shared how her husband had been diagnosed with cancer. We were standing in the narthex of the church, okay? And she shares with me, he was diagnosed with colon cancer. It was devastating. He had horrible surgeries. The recovery didn't go well. It was bad. But he came through it, and he was cancer-free. And I said, oh, that's so fantastic. And I hugged her. You know, we hugged, and we had a moment, and it was great. I said, okay, I'm I'm just going to go get a drink of water. And I walked away. What did I miss? She's my sister in Christ. And not once, not once while she was sharing her story did I say, praise Jesus. At the end, I didn't say, oh, let's pray and, and worship and praise the Lord for what he's done. Not once did I mention that. She's my fellow believer. She's a, like, she sings in the choir, You know, like she's a believer and I couldn't even point to him with my fellow believer. How can I point to him with someone who doesn't believe? How much harder is it, is that? Because I can't even share it with my sister. I went home that day. I was so frustrated with myself. That afternoon I played a little game of the famous uh, Bible roulette, you know, where you open it and you just sort of wait for the answer to come. You flip through the pages. God led me to 2 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 7. God gave us a spirit not of timidity, but of power, love, and self-control. God gave me power, love, and self-control. So where did that timidity come from? Where did my hesitation, where did my fear come from? We all know where that came from. There are two players on the field at all times. So when I'm standing with a fellow Christian and she's sharing and there's a gap where Jesus should be, if I leave that gap and I don't claim it, somebody else is going to claim that. So in that conversation with my friend, when I didn't say it, when I left it out, it didn't benefit the Lord. And that is my purpose. My purpose is to worship and glorify the Lord. So it's time for a new habit. It's time to start talking about Jesus. I might just slip it into an old conversation. It might become a habit. And it might become a new lifestyle. So this brings us to when. When do we talk about Jesus? Maybe we could brainstorm a list of the the times that we could talk about him. Maybe we could categorize them, we could organize them. But really, we need to start in prayer. Ask God where his harvest is. There are people in your life every day that God is working on and pursuing and preparing. Ask him who they are so you're ready. When you go through your day, ask God, him? Her, now, none of us is going to get this right unless Jesus intervenes. So pray. Ask the Lord and then listen. Wait for the answer. Because honestly, I'm not going out there 
unless he's already there. I'm not going to go out on that limb and stick my neck out until I know that he's already there because he's the limb that I'm going to go out on. He's the branch and I am the vine. God is already working in this person's life in this moment. And I have the honor to be there too. If we ask God who and when, he will show us. And we might get the opportunity to have a front row seat when someone recognizes their salvation. This is the opportunity to be there, to be there when the Lord takes up residency in someone's heart. When, God, when, because I want to be there. So where is there? Where do I evangelize? Not here. Not in this building, not in this room. It happens where you go. The Great Commission was to go. So go to make disciples. Not sit in your comfy chair and wait for someone to sit next to you in church. This Sunday morning structure we have is not set up for evangelism as we've defined it. It's more about those of us watching and, and in this room worshiping. This is where we learn God's love. This is where we, we worship. I'd say it's extremely rare. Maybe it's happened. But it's extremely rare that someone would come into this building and ask one of us uh, to tell you about Jesus. Maybe they might ask Steve or they might know that Greg was on staff or maybe Aaron. But they're not going to ask one of us. So we are called to go, go and tell. The harvest God has prepared is out there where we live, where we work, at a meeting, at lunch with a friend. When you show compassion and kindness to someone's troubles, you open a space where you can point to Jesus. All right, now we're to the nitty gritty. What? What do I say? Okay, for my OCD friends like Chris, who raised this concern, when I introduced my outline, I left out the word how. How. And so here we're going to put the how and the what together. You're okay. This is the hard part. Okay? It's okay. Tim Keller suggests that you start with the most basic thing. Just tell people you go to church. If they don't know you're, you're a Christian, you can't go anywhere past that. So just talk about church. What would you do this weekend? I went to the movies. I went to church. How about you? Just leave it there. Just leave it there. If they want to know more, they'll ask. Oh, sorry. Now I'm lost. The second thing Tim Keller says once people understand and they just they know that you go to church, the next thing you need to do is let people know that being a Christian means something to you. It's not just some cool club you join on Sunday mornings. It's something that has changed your life. It means something to you. If you're talking with someone who has a struggle, you can say, this is how my faith has helped me with that struggle. Or my pastor says, my small group leader says, I read a book that says... Just put it out there. This is how my faith has changed things for me. We all have something that our faith has changed for us. For me, I could talk all day about how my faith has changed being a mother and being a wife. And seriously, we could talk all day about that. When the girls were little, I had times when I felt like all I did was clean up messes and feed people. No one appreciated or saw or cared about what I did. I found comfort and strength in Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it wholeheartedly as unto to the Lord. I can't tell you the number of times I stood at the kitchen sink and washed sippy cups or threw sippy cups or whatever awful thing I had to do with the sippy cups, especially the ones that would, were left in the car. Yeah. And I would just say, unto the Lord, unto the Lord. <laughs> Thank God, they're old enough. We don't have sippy cups anymore. 
We can joke about how kids don't come with a manual, but when I need answers about how to raise them, the Lord has those answers. I haven't always listened because I think I can pretty well do it on my own, but when I do, the results are surprising and sometimes even shocking. When Chris and I have a misunderstanding or communication problem, Psalm 19:14, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, my Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I pray that God would protect my heart from unkind thoughts and adding a story against Chris. I find comfort and peace in the word of God. If I'm with a woman struggling with motherhood or with being a wife, I should be able to share how my faith has helped me. Rebecca Pippert. <laughs> Sorry, I had bronchitis this week. It was great. <laughs> Rebecca Pippert, a well-known speaker and author, at least in some circles, Chris had never heard of her, talks about the importance of, she talks about good questions when sharing the gospel. Asking people what they're interested in, what they're passionate about, listening, and carefully asking another question. Eventually, your conversation and your questions will lead to the Lord. If you're talking with someone who works in the healthcare field, you can get around to asking, how do you give people hope in their illness? If you're working with, talking with someone who works in the arts or is passionate about art, you could say, how do you think we get our, our uh, idea about beauty? How do you, where do you think we get that from? Conversations organically turn towards God. And this should, happen, this should have happened when I talked to my friend about her husband with cancer. The conversation turned. But once we got there, I didn't go there. We need to not be afraid to touch the subject of God. Now, if you're thinking this is all well and good, but I'm stuck. I'm stuck in this place where I worry. What if they ask me a question I don't have the answer to? I'm not going to go out there on that limb because what if they ask me something I can't answer? Two things. First of all, Jesus didn't have all the answers. In Mark 13, Jesus was asked when he would return. And in verse 32, he said, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels nor the Son, but only the Father. Jesus didn't know. Only God did. So what makes me think I have to have all the answers? Secondly, there are small group leaders and elders of this church and staff who would be delighted to help you get the answers to some questions. So don't be afraid. The, if the answer is, I don't know, I don't know. But I have people. I will get the answer for you. So in the end, we need to pray for opportunity. Press into that power and love that the Lord has given us. And most of all, start talking. Talk to each other and talk to those around you. God is seeking people you know. This is your chance to be there when they respond to him. Let's pray. Lord of the harvest, we are your workers. Bind up our timidity and fear and loose your power and love in our lives. Show us who and show us when. Lord, we long to be with someone when they meet their salvation. Give us questions and words to share who you are in our lives. Help us to have an evangelist lifestyle where we talk about you to anyone we meet. Thank you that we were once your harvest and now have the opportunity to be your workers. Amen.